They say, hey, Luke, we got this idea. We want you to jump without a parachute. <laughs> and I laughed. I got a wife and a son, and I want to be here to talk about it, you know? How much of this has to do with math? How much is science? How much is psychological? How much is preparation? How much is the right team? I mean, how do you go about preparing for something like this? I think if you don't have all those things, I'm not here talking to you today. I think <laughs> you have to stack the deck in your favor. And I can only imagine the conversations. Are you sure you want to do this? What were those talks like? Best talks that we've ever had in our whole relationship. Wow. I've been married 19 years. Luke, if you had to do it, how could you do it? Is there a way to do it safe? You don't have the level of fear that people have. What do you fear? Yeah, I think I got this. I think everything's going to work out great. But what if it doesn't and why would I want to do something like this? I need to treat this just like another jump. I saw the video. I can't even tell where you're landing. It's tiny. It was so small. I mean, I have over 20,000 jumps. I did about 350 jumps getting ready for this. You could do something that seems impossible if you go about it the right way. Really, it's a simple physics problem. Let's take 220 pounds, going 130 miles an hour, and we need to stop it in about 200 feet. Uh, it's insane. You know, a lot of people consider themselves thrill seekers. I myself, yesterday at my house, my dad was in town. My dad is uh, sitting there to myself and a few of our friends. And he says, this jalapeno is very spicy. Can you take it? Mario takes it. He starts crying. I'm like, give me a break. I can have this jalapeno. So he gives me the jalapeno. I take it for the first five seconds. I look very brave. 15 seconds, I'm good. 30 seconds, I'm good. A minute later, I have the milk, bread, anything you can think about because I was crying like a little baby. But if you think you're a thrill seeker, today is the ultimate thrill seeker because our friend today, Luke Atkins, who is a third generation jumper, he's jumped over nearly 20,000 times. He's been a stuntman and I think Iron Man and Godzilla and a couple other things that he's worked on. He decided recently on Ju uh, July 30th, of 2016, I believe it's July 30th, 2016, to jump with no parachute. Yes, we're talking about jumping with no parachute, 25,000 feet in air and land in a net. You can even see where he was landing, but he was able to pull it off. And there were millions of people to watch it worldwide on the social media, TV news, all this other stuff. So he's with us. Luke, thank you so much for being a guest on Valuetainment. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm stoked to talk to you. So, Luke, I mean, what's the story with wanting to jump out of a plane with no parachutes? I mean, there's better things to do in life. You have a, I think your son's name is Logan. I think you're married. You're happily married. I mean, why would you want to jump out of a 25 feet up without any parachute? Sort of funny story. Uh, I got a phone call. It said, hey, Luke, will you sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement? And I was like, sure, I get to hear about all kinds of cool stuff. After I helped Felix Baumgartner jump from the edge of space and some yeah. other things I've done. And uh, they give me this thing and I'm just, sure I sign it. And they get me on the phone and uh, they say, hey, Luke, we got this idea. We want you to jump without a parachute. <laughs> and I laughed and uh, I told him, thanks, but no thanks. I got a wife and a son, the exact things you're just saying. Yeah. Um, I might appear to be this crazy nutball, but hey, man, I got a life. I, I need to be around. I couldn't figure out how to do it. I said, thanks, but no thanks. I'll help you find somebody. I'll find the crazy guy to do it. Then I started thinking in my mind, I kept waking up in the middle of the night. Luke, if you had to do it, how could you do it? Is there a way to do it safe? How can we get there? And then I started coming up and churning, calling people. And I called them back and I said, hey, I think I'm in. Let's do it like this. And then what happened next? So you say you're in. Then, Because I'm assuming for a guy, I watch some, some of the interviews, I watch the videos. How much of this has to do with math? How much is science? How much is psychological? How much is preparation? How much is the right team? I mean, how do you go about preparing for something like this? I think if you don't have all those things, I'm not here talking to you today. I think you have to stack that. You have to stack the deck in your stack the deck in your favor. I just finished working with David Blaine, so I got a lot of card references right now. So uh, you stack the deck by you know come up with the idea. This guy came to me with the idea, Chris Talley, and I was like, you know, no way. And then I started thinking, okay, maybe there's a way to do it. Let's let's do it. I started calling some stunt guys, and really, it's a simple physics problem. Let's take 220 pounds going 130 miles an hour. And we need to stop it safely in about 200 feet. And, and how do we do it? So it's like a kid science project on a massive scale that you get to test at the end with your life. So that part was pretty cool. Yeah. By the way, how old were you when you had your first jump? Uh, I was 12 years old when I made my first tandem skydive. And I started jumping by myself when I was 16. You uh, at 16. And then the, the family, it started off with your grandpa, I believe, right? Yeah. My grandpa got shot down during the war. Uh, tried to open up the cockpit and bail out. 
I crash landed in allied territory in a field, all fine, came back from the war. And he always wondered what it would have been like that day if he could have jumped out. So him and a buddy went to a skydiving club in the 60s and made one jump. He fell in love with it um, back when instructors had five jumps. And he got the family business started. And my aunt and uncle took that club and turned it into a full-blown family operation that they were running to today. Now, I remember being in the Army. I was at 101st Airborne when uh, you would hear stories of guys who would go to become jumpers. Back in the 60s, there was a risk of breaking your knee because the way you were coming down and technology wasn't as good. The equipment wasn't as good. How much has uh, uh, you know, equipment and technology advanced over the last 1960s, last 50, 60 years? Uh, it's insane. So like back when you jumped and uh, you had to be tough, you just had to be tough. There was no way around it. You're coming down a round parachute. It's simply how big is the parachute? How much do you weigh? That controls how hard you hit the ground. Then technology changed. They came up with a parafoil design, um, which is more like the wing of an airplane. And now we're gliding in with the materials and the design changes. We're gliding in like a, a glider airplane Got and it. we flare the parachute out and we get tiptoe landings nowadays compared to back then. I mean, respect for all those guys in the army. They're still doing it today, right? Yeah, they're, they're still doing it out, today. All that stuff bailing out and crash landing in a field and then have to go to work. I was at 101st Airborne, even though it was an airborne unit, by the time I got there, they stopped airborne, they did aerosol. So I only did aerosol. I never had the opportunity to do airborne, but I respected airborne guys uh, like yourself. So, you know, th there is this real cool picture you showed of your entire family. It was like two cousins, grandpa, aunt, auntie. Can you talk? I mean, assume the audience is looking at the picture right now. Talk about the picture that you have with your family jumping. Yeah. So my family's got, you know, I grew up on it. When I was 16, it wasn't uh, so much of if you were going to jump, it's when. You know, as soon as I was able, we jumped right in there. And I was the older of a bunch of my cousins. So we all started skydiving. As it got bigger and bigger, uh, we started jumping more and more. And most people, you know, you go play sports at high school. At the end of the day, you'd zip back over, jump back into skydiving, pack parachutes to make more jumps. And it was kind of like a, a family business. If you worked at a restaurant, you're a busboy. Uh, in our family, you pack parachutes. It's it's similar to my conversation with Walanda, where he said seven generation they walked on wire rope, tight ropes, and that's what they did for a living, and that was their family thing. But do you do you notice a common thread or a common trend with people that you run into that are obsessive or or love jumping as much as you do? Is there a commonality? Yeah, what, what I think it does is skydiving gives you a freedom, whether you're a world class skydiver or someone who just made a jump or two and you have this common bond. You find this small group of people that not very many people in the world have experienced what you have. And, and it kind of draws you in and it, it kind of consumes your life and it becomes part of, you have this bond that not many people have of jumping out of an airplane together. I mean, in the world, you know, maybe there's 300,000 people who've made a skydive, including one jump, you know? And, and that's a very small group of people on the planet that have gotten to feel what you do. So I think it draws you in and then you just want to get some people out of that competitive spirit. You want to just go, go, go and be a world-class competitor. Or you just want the freedom of a guy on the weekend going out to the Y and playing basketball with their friends. It's the same thing with skydiving, just a little more adventurous. Yeah, it, it, there seems to be a very common personality on how they are and, you know, what, what you know, it's very interesting when I run into them. I have friends that are just diehard jumpers and they can't get enough of it. They, they can't wait for the next one. It's like they're fiending it. It's like an addict. I got to have my next jump. I get, I get that feeling about them. But since your jump that you had, you know, the year Roger Bannister broke the record of four minute mile, you know, they say, oh, when he ran, broke the four minute mile, 30 something people did it the following year. Ever since you jump without a parachute, how many people have done it since you? Uh, nobody. No. That, see, that's what's crazy about it. That's what's crazy about this record, Luke. I mean, I know for you, you know, you're the person that did it. We're the audience, okay? So there's 7.7 there's .7 .7 billion people in the world. A lot of people can, can say they climb Mount Everest. A lot of people can say they did a lot of different. There's many billionaires in the world. There are $4 trillion companies in the world. There's only one, let me say the proper adjective, courageous guy. <laughs> <laughs> there's only one 
courageous guy that jumped out of a plane, 25,000 feet, 215, 220 pounds, going 120 miles an hour with 200 feet at the bottom that was willing to do it. Can you, can you kind of take a couple minutes and walk us through the entire process? I know you said Felix called you. You said yes. You signed the NDA. You kind of went through the process of that. But then what happened from there? The day of talking to family, preparation, concerns, fears. Walk us through a little bit. Yeah, no problem. First off, when you say like I'm the only person who's done it, this is true. Uh, Travis Pastrana jumped out uh, without a parachute, but clipped into somebody. You know, they've all landed with the parachute. This was the first time doing it without a without a parachute, without anything, and coming all the way to the net. Um, and I think that what that shows that nobody has attempted it. it it's interesting because from my skydiver friends, my peers, I would say, my, my equals in skydiving. Um, the respect that you get, and like some people say, it's crazy, it's stupid, why would you do it? But to a person, every single person's come back to me um, saying that that moment that you step out and that commitment and the self-confidence to be able to make something like that happen is something that just doesn't come along. And, and I think that doing it once, I'm done. You know, I did it one time, that's good. And I think people really realized how serious that was. But um, going back to, I get the call, hey, can you do this? How can we do it? They had an idea of a giant slide. Mm -hmm. landing on a giant half pipe in like the Grand Canyon, sliding it out. Theoretically, that makes sense to me. You match the wall with your body and you come down, you touch the wall and you slide out like a big skateboard ramp. I just couldn't figure out how can you test that? Can you drop something in that net and make it swoop out? Again, I got a wife and a son and um, I want to be here to talk about it. You know, I wanted to see, is there a way I could do this? Yeah. Where it's not the flip of a coin. I really worked hard to make sure that yes, I'm the crazy guy that jumped out of a plane without a parachute. But I also wanted to show that you could do something that seems impossible if you go about it the right way. We made baby steps. So came up with the netting idea uh, to land in a giant, almost like a circus net, um, really strong netting. Then um, to slow it down, we used air cylinders, big pistons. So when you hit the net, it compressed the air and it shh, pulled it out. There was talk of uh, bungee cords and all different kinds of things. But the only thing I could picture is Wiley e. Coyote hitting a net and shooting back up into space. <laughs> so we end up with this air system and this net. And then we want to know, hey, can this work? You know, like, I, I want to see, is this even possible? So we built a, a half scale model um, in a friend's yard, Jim Churchman, the stunt coordinator down in California. We started dropping uh, punching bags filled with weights into this net and measuring the G-forces. And we start to figure out, wow, we can actually do this. So then we built a full scale one, a 100 feet by 100 feet. We took it out in the middle of the desert. We took a helicopter. Aaron Fitzgerald flies this dummy up. We called it a dummy. Um, it was this weight that matched my weight in the same drag. And we started dropping it in the net from lower and lower. My wife and son come out to watch and we're measuring the G-forces and they come out to check it out. The very first drop, they take this thing up in the air and they drop it. It cuts through the net like butter and smashes into the ground right in front of my wife and son. <laughs> Camera crews are all film documentary. They all turn to my wife right, right away. And my wife has a big smile on her face. And they're like, oh, Luke, you know, what's going on? This is over. We haven't even gotten started. They all think it's over. And my wife looked at me and the cameras and she said, well, I think it's great because now it's not happening. You know, we're not doing this thing. <laughs> so for her, it but was She really didn't life. want it to happen. Uh, it wasn't so much she didn't want it to happen. It was just she understands the reality of how dangerous Got this it. is. Yeah. But when that didn't work, she knows I'm not going to do it if that's how it works. Mm -hmm. So in her mind, okay, this is done. We're not doing this thing. We're going to collect a little paycheck and hang out. And that's that. Uh, and then as the testing started coming along and we started, we fixed the netting. We fixed the problem with what, how it ended up going through the net. We'll get everything sorted out and then it all starts to hit home. It starts to get real that, you know, we're doing this, you know, and that's when my wife and I had to have some real talks about the possibilities that could come from this. You know, we went into this with our eyes open. We definitely were not, uh, everything's rosy and there's no way anything bad can happen. I think that the guys that go into big stunts like this with that attitude where nothing can happen to me, I think that they're naive and irresponsible, you know? we are taking a risk when you step off and do something like that. Now I've stacked the deck in my favor. We've calculated it. It's calculated risk. It's not flip of a coin, fingers crossed, maybe it'll work. It was very dialed in that we were certain it was going to work. I just had to do my job and hit that net that day. And, you know, we had those long talks with the wife. It was a real deal. And, and what was that kind of, what was that like? Because I mean, I can only imagine the conversations. Are you sure you want to do this? I mean, you know, we have a life of ahead of us. You know, what, what if something goes wrong? What were those talks like? 
So, you know, before we went down to California, it was like, yeah, it's getting closer. It's getting real. We finally got permission to do this without a parachute, to wear, to not to wear a parachute from the FAA. And then for me, that was the day it got real for me. I always thought someone's going to step in, Luke, and stop this, right? God. We announced it on Fox. This is happening live. Yep. I'm sure I'm confident, but I'm confident somebody is going to stop, step in and say, hey, whoa, whoa, pump the brakes. You can't do this, especially not live on TV. Uh, and we get a letter saying, not that we support it from the FAA, but we see that you've found a, essentially a loophole in the rules and there's nothing that we could do to stop this. And at that moment on, I was like, whoa, it got very real for me. Um, and so I was in the mindset of it happening. On our way to California, my wife got very quiet. We flew our own little private Cessna down. She got real quiet on the plane ride a couple of days in. And then we're out at the site and she's watching and seeing everything goes. And I woke up two days before the jump. I walked out onto the beach. Um, and we we're staying at a little beach house there in Oxnard. It's a friend's house. And she goes, hey, can I go out with you? I was like, sure. Our son was sleeping. We walked out on the beach and we sat there. It's probably, I almost get emotional talking about it now. It's probably one of the best talks that we've ever had in our whole relationship. Wow. I've been married 19 years. And I asked her flat out, I said, you know, where's Logan going to be? Where's our son going to be when the jump happens? And she had a different answer than I expected. I, I wanted him to be with her and all that. And she said, Logan's going to be with my mom. I want to be as close to the net as possible. If something happens, I have the rest of my life to be with our son, but I have only that moment with you, yeah. which is like, I mean, that's a real, that answer I was not expecting. Wow. She had obviously put a lot of thought into this, you know, we talked about it and she had, she's very practical and she had thoughts of, well, if something happens, how do we get this airplane home that we flew down in? What logistically has to happen? She's very, I think that's the way she helped deal with it was thinking very clinically about those kind of things, but you know, we went in with our eyes fully open to the possibilities. Now we had that talk after that, we took a nice deep breath and, you know, everything moved forward just like it planned. What, she did have power at that jump that nobody knew she had. She had a radio um, to talk to the pilot in the airplane. The pilot mm -hmm. was a lifelong friend. If she had any bad feelings, anything she didn't like, she was going to call up to Dave and tell, say, Hey, Dave, Monica, Dave was going to wiggle the tail of the airplane and I would have sat down and not jumped. And like I said, that would have been almost harder than actually jumping, but she had all of that control right up, right up until we went. Who, who knew that only you, Dave and Monica knew that nobody else knew. That's correct. Nobody. Wow. Else. She had a radio that would talk to him and it was kind of our little thing. I said, if you get any feelings, you don't like something, you're not happy. You know, this is about us and our family. It's about me, obviously. I'm the greedy one that wants to jump out of a plane without a parachute. <laughs> she wouldn't choose to do that. But, you know, we are a family and we got to do this together. Now, what, a, what a cool story. Did, did you have any conversations with Logan as well? Did he kind of know what's going on? And, and what was his reaction? So Logan was four at the time. Okay. Um, he understands skydiving. He's been around and he's seen his whole life. Uh, he did ask me, there was talk in the beginning whether I was going to use this net or an airbag. And it went back and forth, back and forth. And he heard the conversations and my wife was involved listening. And one night I was put in a bed. He goes, Hey dad, are you going to use an airbag or a net? What are you going to use? And he was four. And I said, I don't know, Logan, whichever one's safer. And he said, well, what if neither one are safe? I said, then we won't do it. And he's like, okay. And he goes back to his Legos. You know what I mean? That's a kid. Yeah. Right. He's like, okay, dad says he's only going to do it if it's safe. That's it. You know? So when I look back on it and I know he was sitting there when I did the jump and nowadays i think that's crazy looking back thinking yeah. you know my son was sitting right there and you know you're you're throwing it all out there that, yeah ex i mean i saw that one for i think the first guy came out he gave you a high five then your wife gave you a big hug and you saw everybody else that was there when you landed uh, uh the jump so you said something you said when you when you met with the seattle seahawks psychologist mike gervais he told you that every time somebody's about to face something big Two weeks before the event, they have a moment where it's kind of like you're almost second uh, guessing yourself. Did you have that moment privately yourself or no? Yeah. And so Mike Gervais, such a cool dude. He helped uh, Felix Baumgartner jump from the edge of space. He was there helping get over some mental claustrophobia and stuff like that. And Mike, I knew him then. He came in to just, you know, put a little sanity in this thing, right? You're jumping out of a plane without a parachute. And he had a couple of good points. He asked me, I'm a big sports guy. He said, Luke, I've worked with a couple big NFL teams and done this stuff. 
How are you going to approach this jump? Is this the biggest jump of your life? Or is this just another jump? He said, neither one of them is wrong way to approach it. It's just a different mindset. Is this the biggest thing you're ever going to do? Or is this the, the, just another day? And I told him in that moment right then, I said, Mike, this is the biggest jump I'm ever going to do. He thought for me, he goes, okay. And we started to approach it like that. That night I went to sleep and I called him back the next day. I called Mike and I said, you know what? This is just another jump. I need to treat this just like another jump. And he said, that's great. That's the way he figured I would be thinking. But so Mike worked with me with that. And he said to me, at some point, you're going to have these thoughts about, hey, what, what, are you, what are you doing? Why would you do this? You know, those kind of things. He said it usually, he thought it would happen before two weeks. Um, and really, I didn't have that moment until I was about halfway up on the airplane on game day, right? I'm riding up in the plane about halfway up. You have an oxygen mask on and you just hear yourself breathing like Darth Vader, right? There's, you're all alone. You can't talk because everyone has the oxygen on. And I started thinking, I had flashbacks of my son and my wife and like, hey, why am I doing this? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I think I got this. I think everything's gonna work out great. But what if it doesn't? And why would I wanna do something like this? Um, put all of this at risk. I've built this life for myself. And why would you risk that? And in that moment in the plane, my cousin Andy was jumping with me. He was one of the guys wearing a camera. He was also taking the oxygen system from me. Andy reaches over and he gives me a Charlie horse on my right thigh, punches my leg, points his altimeter and goes like this, like, calm down. You got a second. It's that nonverbal communication that we had. He's got 5,000 jumps with me. In that moment, it shook it off. And I only thought about the jump from that wow. moment on moving forward. That was that moment in my mind. And Mike thought it would happen way before, <laughs> way before I was about to jump. But, but I had that, that feeling for sure. That, that's, that's great to have somebody like that prepare you whether this is going to be the biggest event of your life or it's going to be one of the events. Did he explain to you why either matter in preparation? Did, did he break that down or no? A, a little bit. Uh, what, what he, he didn't want to direct me. He's very, very, Mike is top. No, I mean, he's world-class. He doesn't really tell you what, like, I always want to answer a guy like that, a psychiatrist. I want to answer correctly, right? I'm looking for the right answer. Like he says, Hey, what are you? I'm, I want him to tell me what I should be feeling. Right. And he's pretty good at keeping you, you know, making those decisions. Um, and I will say that when we started talking about the biggest jump of my life, I think that's a different preparation. You're like, this is the biggest. It psychs you up. You know, you have to get to a different energy level, right? Super Bowl, you're coming mm -hmm. out charging. Yep. Um, or do you want to be my personal peak performance is not at a 10. It's about a seven or a, a five and a half to a seven is where I personally can focus. You're not over amped on the world and all these outside forces you could focus, but you are jacked up for the moment. So there is a difference in how you would prepare for something like this. There's a reason why he is who he is. So I, I wonder, you know, why he felt uh, said that, whether it's the biggest or not, uh, if it was a method for him to uh, uh, alleviate some of the pressure of you. But going back to the jump, so your your uh, your friend, I think you said your cousin or somebody who's got five thousand jumps with you, he punches you, gives you a Charlie horse, and you're about to jump. So then you jump out, okay? When you jump out, the jump is what, two minutes and 39 seconds? I don't know if, it, if it's two minutes and 30 seconds. It's something it's like about that. Two, it's about two minutes and six seconds till I hit the okay. net. Oh, till you hit the net. Okay. So it's two minutes and six seconds when you're hitting the net. So you're going down. When you're all the way at the top and you jump, I saw the video. I can't, I can't even tell where you're landing. It's tiny. It was so small. It's uh, You can see the area. You can't see the net, but you see – the area you're headed. So you can start heading that direction. Uh, and then about halfway down, you really start to pick out the pieces, but it's no joke. I mean, when I jumped out, you couldn't make out the net. You could make out the area where the net was. So you knew you're in the right area, but you really can't see it. And, and while you're going that, I'm assuming that when you do this 20,000 times, you kind of have a way of uh, moving your body and maneuvering. So you kind of know how to center yourself. How hard is that to do with all the wind, with movements, everything going on? So that was the second biggest thing, right? We figured out how to make the net. We knew the net would work. We dropped these dummies in there, measured the G-forces. Jim Churchman had it dialed in. We knew if I hit the net, I'm good. But the biggest thing about this is hitting that net. Imagine being in a river or out in the ocean. You go out in the ocean, you hit the tide, and it starts to slide you down the beach a little bit, right? If you want it to always stay in the same spot on the beach, you have to swim forward. The tide gets stronger, you have to swim faster, less you swim slower. Same with the wind, but the wind's coming from all different directions. Mm -hmm. so as you jump out, you have to start maneuvering your body forward. Sometimes 
you're in this big forward movement, but that's because the wind is going 40 miles an hour. So that means you have to go 40 miles an hour forward to be able to go straight down. So you have to manipulate that all the way down. I had some <laughs> lights that helped guide me in, but you're fighting that all the way down, right? Fighting the wind and working your way in and getting closer and closer. And that took a lot of jumps. I did, I mean, I have over 20,000 jumps. I did about 350 jumps getting ready for this. And I did 70, uh, my wife and I deal 75 jumps in a row, opening my parachute below 1,000 feet, right above the top of the net. So that's scary by itself, opening below 1,000 feet. So I did 75 in a row, opening my parachute directly over the center. And from 1,000 feet to the net would it be about three seconds by the time you would fall. And nothing's going to grab you and throw you off for three seconds. So we did that over and over. By the time we did the real jump, which was my worst approach, by the way, the real deal, um, ended up, I did 82 times in a row by the time we did it for real. You can't throw a piece of garbage in a trash can 82 times in a row. 82 times in a row. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you land. I saw when you landed, you didn't move for about eight seconds, nine seconds. And then you started kicking. You know, you were all excited when you're kicking. And then you're on the ground. You give the high five. Your wife gives you a hug. Everybody's coming celebrating with you. How are you feeling at that moment? So when I hit the net, like, that's another thing that Mike told me. He's like, when, when you land and this is all good, take a minute, take a second and just take it in. And in that moment, I'm not an emotional guy. I'm not into the touchy feely nonsense. Uh, I'm more tough it out, rub some dirt on it and get going. Um, in that moment, I put my hands over my head like this and it was just kind of overwhelming. All that work, all that preparation. And I did it, you know, and it just took a second. Then I started celebrating. And the best thing is that high five you see when I first hit the net, that was my medical exam. That was the doc. <laughs> I told him, I'm like, hey, I'm either going to be okay or it's not going to matter, you know? But that was my <laughs> medical exam with the high five. I mean, what's he going to do if you don't make it, right? I yeah, mean, it's that just was kind, hey. of, kind of my point. But the, uh, I was honestly felt this like vibrating, like feeling of the whole thing. And I got to say, I wasn't so much, I like, Mike Gervais as a dude, like a really great guy. I didn't really get in the beginning the value that someone like that brings to someone like me. Um, I didn't really, I'm like, oh, I'm well adjusted, uh, blah, blah. But the stuff by the time up until about two weeks prior to the jump, I could visualize myself hitting the net, making contact with the net, but nothing after that, right? I, I couldn't see past that. But about two weeks prior, I started thinking that I could see times like this, right? I was visualizing, talking to people about it and moving on. And those kind of things help. They're little steps that I didn't think I needed, but in the end were huge, right? They, they're a comfort level. You Very know, interesting. Yeah. Visualization for me, I'm like, I'm not meditating. I'm not whatever. And then Mike says, I got news for you. <laughs> you are meditating. You just don't know it. You know, the way, I'm, the way I think about things is on the ride up in the plane, I'm dirt diving into my head or I'm visualizing the, the jump down and the flip and I do it three or four times on the way up. He's like, every time you do that, that is meditation. That is focus. I just don't sit there in a quiet room by myself and make um noises, uh, but it's all the same. And that preparation was huge to be able to make me feel comfortable in the moment. Luke, who's the craziest uh, person that you least expected that you hadn't spoken for a while that contacted you to say congratulations? You, you, did you hear from a high school teacher or a friend from, was, was there anybody that's like, I cannot believe you made this jump? Yeah, I mean, tons of high school kids, you know, friends call you up and, and hit you up. Um, but for me, there were a few of the skydivers in the world that were like my idols when I grew up as a kid, right? That like Craig Girard, he was one of like the world famous skydiver for me. Golden Knight was world champion umpteen times over. He made his way out to watch this jump in person that day. And like, that was such a cool thing for me to wow. feel like the, that I had made that, that jump, you know, somebody mm -hmm. that I looked up to as a skydiving, you know, type of hero and they're there and they acknowledged and appreciated what I did. That's huge. That's cool. Somebody you admire that comes now watching you perform and do something like this. That's got to be a great feeling. Uh, you know, they say the, the, the biggest fear uh, men have is public speaking. You know, a lot of people are frightened of getting on stage and speaking to an audience. But historically, I don't think anyone's died from speaking from stage. I don't think that's ever happened. Now, there's different stories with people that decide to jump out of a plane. And then there's stories of people that want to jump without a parachute, which is a guy like you that wants to jump out. If, if you don't have the level of, you know, fear that people have because you've done 20,000 jumps, 
what do you fear? And, and how, how do you look at public speaking yourself when you're up there speaking to an audience of a thousand, five thousand people? So when this thing started after this jump, I went and gave some talks and um, I, I used to start my talks. Off, now I'm a little more comfortable, but I used to start my talks out by saying, hey, thank you for having me. But I would much rather jump out of an airplane without a parachute than stand up in front of you guys and talk um, to you. It was that kind of, of, of feeling. But for me, I always have this mindset now that I think of what's the worst thing that can happen. Right. I try and tell my eight year old son, whether it's water ski on a lake or whatever, what's the worst that can happen? Not not the worst thing you could possibly imagine, but what's realistically the worst can happen. You're going to fall and get wet. I'm going to sit up there. I'm going to stumble my words. Those 5,000 people are going to think I'm an idiot and I'm going to move on with my life, but it's really not going to have an effect on me. Um, so those are the ways that I was able to deal with mm. those kind of fears. And I, I try to relate that to everything else. And now if I'm doing a jump, that seems a little bit hairball, whether it's jumping into a soccer stadium or NFL game and it's windy or the conditions aren't right. I look back on what I just did, you know, Hey, I jumped out a plane without a parachute. This is a piece of cake, you know, no big deal. That's so cool. That, that's kind of how I, 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 my bracket has changed, right? It used to be small and now it, it's huge. Yeah. I mean, not everybody has a story to tell like you, so I bet when you're getting up there telling a story, people are going crazy. wanting to hear specific stories, uh, details of what happened. So when you worked on Iron Man, which Iron Man was it? So Iron Man three, uh, okay. where, uh, Iron Man Air Force One blows up and Iron Man uh -huh. starts scooping everybody up, the barrel of monkeys scene. So I was the last guy to get rescued. As, I, as they're coming in, Iron Man, uh, Robert Downey Jr. is like, hey, here comes the chunky monkey. We got to catch him last. And they fly down and, you know, grab your arm. And that was a really cool scene. And that was happening. Uh, that was before this jump. Um, but it was that was really cool to be part of, of the Hollywood stunt scene. And since then, I've done quite a few other little projects along the did way. You have a, did you have interactions with Robert Downey or no? No. No, no, no. Second unit stunt stuff. You don't. Oh, I got that. it. Okay. Yeah. Because, you know, for the last four weeks, we go through a series with my kids and I have to watch uh, Avengers 1, 2, 3. I think we just finished uh, uh, the, the Infinity War. I think I don't know which one, what it's called, where Thanos is getting all the five rings and we now have to go to the end game to watch it again with these kids because they love this stuff. But uh, when you yeah, said I Iron Man, I thought. Uh, uh, Black Widow, I. I coordinated a, a sequence in Black Widow that's going to come out with uh, Scarlett Johansson, like a skydiving scene where there's some fighting going on. So you got to check that one out. You're, you're in that one as well. Uh, I coordinated that one. I coordinated oh, that's cool. That is cool. I'm looking forward to that. So how was it working with David Blaine? How, how, how was that experience? David's a quite the character, man. He, uh, I hear. Yeah, he called me up. He's a cool cat. He has this idea and this vision, what he wanted to do. And he came to me and he's like, Luke, you know, you did the craziest thing ever. These other guys on the craziest thing ever. I don't want to do the craziest thing ever. I want to do something beautiful and amazing. And I've dreamed about this since a little kid. Can you imagine grabbing some balloons, helium balloons and floating away? And I said, yeah, I think every kid's imagined it. He's like, I want to do it. I want to do it for real. I want to try and do it over New York. And I was like, dude, I'm in. Let's figure it out. And so uh, I got to spend, I, I helped teach him some skydiving. We worked on some techniques. He'd come stay here at the house. I would come in the living room. He'd be teaching my eight-year-old magic tricks on the couch. And my eight-year-old could do David Blaine magic tricks that I don't know. <laughs> That's crazy. cool. Yeah. Such a, such a cool dude. But he definitely, working with artists is interesting. I'm more of a practical guy. This, this, this. And I get A plus B plus C equals D or whatever. He has a vision, right? And he's not willing to compromise. I'm like, man, it'd be way easier if we could do it like this. He's like, no, this is what I want. And uh, pretty cool to work with different personalities like that, that know what they want. There's no compromise. He's going after it. Would you put him as a qualified crazy that wants to push the envelope and do stuff that seems unbelievable to the rest of us? I, I would totally put him in that category. The stuff that he does and that he's done um, it, it blows my mind. Like when I'm talking, I'm like, Hey, when you were in the ice and we did this, like where I was trying to, what was the gag? What was the trick? He's like, well, I was in the ice. <laughs> There's no trick. It's like straight up being miserable mm. for that amount of time. It, it's crazy to me, the things that he's done. Uh, and what's really neat to me about all of those things is the world's full of craziness and all this nonsense going on. And it's so fun to take a few minutes away from that and just enjoy something like, floating with balloons i mean which one of us couldn't think of it i want to get helium and float my kid in the yard with balloons it's just, yeah it's so did fun. you do any of it when he was did you try some as well or no was it uh, mainly him i played with it all but this was about him about david okay. doing his thing right. my job was there to support him and help make it as safe as possible so i ended up project managing it and running it and i thought it was awesome a company like youtube steps up 
and, you know, back something like that. I mean, who, I don't know how they make money on that, but the fact they were in there to help make that happen was awesome. And by the way, for, for your jump, the 25,000 jump without a parachute, how long did it take from ideation, the day you had to sign the NDA, to the actual date, July 30th, execution 2016? What's the timeline? I think it was about a year and a half to two years on that wow. one. I mean, they had to find a, a sponsor. You know, I'm sponsored by Red Bull, have been for most of mm -hmm. my career. Red Bull didn't do that one. Red Bull stepped back from that particular one. Uh, we pitched it to Red Bull. I went in there and I've been with Red Bull since 2005 and helped Felix with his jump, done a bunch of stuff. I went into the headquarters um, and just prior, a, a wingsuit person had, had passed away, a Red Bull sponsor wingsuit person. And articles came out, is Red Bull pushing athletes? Are they, you know, making us do these things? Got these it. are all things I'm out there doing no matter what, with or without. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Red Bull said, you know what? We'd like to, we're going to pass on this one. Uh, and I think at that moment, they might've thought it was over. And then some of these guys behind this, Jimmy and Chris, went out and found uh, Stride Gum, a gum, Stride Gum, Mondelez, Stride Gum, sponsored that whole thing. And then somehow they convinced Fox to let it go live on TV, like a seven second delay. I'm jumping out of a plane without a parachute. If something happens, I don't know, does the screen go black? Like what happens at that point when you're live? It's seriously crazy to think about that. Fox yeah. said yes, and a gum company it's sponsored the whole thing. The, the trust that they had in me, it, it's like, I can never repay them enough. I mean, Stride stepping up and Fox behind them saying, hey, we trust your ability. We don't think anything's going to happen. It was never, hey, what happens if that happens? I never got those talks. They just never came that way. That's, it was all full speed ahead, which is incredible. That tells you how much they trust you. By the way, Luke, any next projects coming up with you? Are you working on anything big? Anything you want to share with the audience? Yeah, man, I've been trying for a bunch of years since before I did the no parachute jump. I had this idea and it's a spin on something I saw when I was a kid. But now since the no parachute jump, people answer my phone calls when I call up. You get a little more, you got a little more class in the David yeah. Blaine thing and, <laughs> and all these, you know, you, you, they answer your phone calls. You're not a crazy guy anymore. Um, I have this idea where I want to fly one airplane. My cousin Andy, who was on the big jump with me, fly another one. Nobody else in them. Fly these planes up to 13, 14,000 feet in the air, all by ourselves, nobody else in formation. Put them in a dive straight at the ground. Jump out of each airplane. So ghost ride the airplanes, leave them empty and switch planes. I'll go get in his plane. He'll go get in mine, pull them up and bring them back down and land them. Come on. Yeah, man, that's what I'm working on. <laughs> What's the timeline on this? <laughs> Uh, the timeline is finishing selling it off to sponsors. I mean, I got the planes. We're pretty much ready to go with the airplanes. And it takes a lot of research and development and FAA. And what's cool about something like this, it, it involves our flying. I mean, I got seven, 8,000 hours flying airplanes and 20,000 skydives. It kind of brings every part of my life since I was a little kid into one stunt, which is very cool for me to be able to showcase aviation to the world. Well, buddy, that is crazy. The fact that you're doing that and courageous. Let me, again, I want to remind of those two C's, man. I don't want I like to leave one without C. the other. <laughs> Say that again. I like the second C. Yeah. Yeah. Courageous. I know you do. I know you like the second yeah, yeah. one. The, the first one, I can't crazy. help myself. Keeps coming out. I got to tell you. Hey, you got to uh, be a little crazy to do this stuff. I'm not going to shy away from that. I mean, I, 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 that's why people tune in. Yeah. I mean, when you're the only person that's ever done something, you are in a league of your own. There is no, you know, there's like 58 of you. There's one person that's done this. And uh, brother, thank you so much for coming out and being a guest and just talking to us openly, whether it was the conversation you had with your wife on the beach when Logan was uh, sleeping to your experience with Blaine and what you're getting ready to work here. We have a, we'll be rooting you on when that day happens. And we'll remember this conversation that we had here together on Value All right. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks Great. for being a guest, man. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. So you just heard a man that jumped out of a plane at 25,000 feet without a parachute on and landed on a net, which is crazy. What's the craziest thing you've ever done? Comment below. Uh, I thought his story was fascinating, heartfelt. And at the same time, if you enjoyed this interview, I think you would also enjoy the interview I did with Nick Wallanda, who walks on wire rope. And he's a seven-generation wire rope uh, a walker, which is pretty intense when you watch this interview. If you've not seen it, click over here to watch it. And if you've not subscribed to the channel, please do so. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.